You see my botnet back there? I got Buddhas connected to my botnet. I got hella Buddhas. Hella Buddhas. Buddhas. Hella Buddhas. Buddhas. Hella Buddhas. Buddhas. I got Buddhas connected to my botnet. Hanging out on hack forums, best believe I got warrants. Telling all who listened that my botnet's not boring. Modified Mariah and I'm mixing in the minor. Comes as no surprise, getting wrecked by a minor. Cover up his drop there, looking for me everywhere. No, I'm really not there. Places I will not share. Drop a couple backups, I know you won't find me. Buy a couple more smart bulbs, won't you kindly? Screen him, Captain Phillips. Who the hell are you? Wonder why your toaster's connected to are you? Why your toaster's toasting? I'm using it for roasting. Some kid got busy boasting. Now his mode on smoking. Keep the crypto flowing. I need my money now. But I gotta go, cause my mom says study now. I'm calling all the shots, and it's time for me to score. I got a couple spots, hit me up on Discord. Botnet, I got hella booters Botnet, take over your rooters Botnet, in your internet of things Botnet, man this shit hella stings Botnet, I got hella booters Botnet, take over your rooters Botnet, in your internet of things Botnet, man this shit hella stings Botnet, I got hella booters Botnet, take over your rooters Botnet in another things well that was amazing <laughs> well thanks so much dade um for that amazing um intro i i was not really sure what to think when i just got a, a pm saying that um there was a theme song for my talk um so hi everybody um thanks for for coming and hanging out let me um hold on Making sure everybody can hear me, right? Old chat, you can hear me. Um, say hi if you can. Just making sure. Got a terrible microphone. All right, cool, cool. Okay, so let's get going. Um, so yeah, it's my talk. Um, I'll just uh, get right into it. So who am I? Uh, I'm Ned Spooky, uh, senior reverse engineer at Redacted Company. Uh, I primarily work on embedded devices, uh, firmware, uh, industrial control systems, and uh, taking apart uh, proprietary network protocols. You know me online um, as either NetSpooky or you, um, and uh, I contribute OSS tooling and other errata for uh, Threat Intel, for RE, and uh, offensive security. Um, so, all right, we're still uh, do a little background on this. So, why do this talk? Um, so, I know that there's a lot of people that you know have seen IoT botnets, whether it be how you've been affected by it or see people talking about them online, and um, you know, I had done a bit of my own research, and I really kind of wanted to to add, you know, uh, a bit of perspective from from my end on this, um, because IoT botnets are definitely still incredibly prevalent. Um, you know, we are all affected by them, whether we like it or not. Um, you know, if your work Slack is suddenly down because of somebody's fight on Xbox Live or Minecraft, um, you know, this is this is affecting you in some way. Um, but I don't think a lot of people take them as seriously. A lot of people think it's like, you know, kitty stuff, like script kitty stuff, um, which is unfortunate because it definitely is something that is, you know, an issue that we all have to deal with. Um, and so, um, oh, hold on. I spent a good amount of time collecting malware sources. So I started doing this uh, in about 2018. And um, I had been collecting and developing tools to analyze, um, analyze source code and analyze binaries, um, which I'll get into later. Uh, I studied a lot of the commonly exploited vulnerabilities and wanted to know more about like why they were so prevalent. Like why, why can you have four million hacked routers on your um, on your botnet? It doesn't you know? It's insane to me. Um, so I wanted to inform others about the impact of their technology choices, specifically firmware devs and um, people who are also end consumers. And I also wanted to propose some ideas for how to address these. Um, and so I also this talk I should have given it said about a year ago. Um, or, or so, um, it's just kind of been pushed onto the back burner a bit, but um, I tried to update it as much as I could, and I also had to kind of cut out some of the parts, which I'll talk about as I go through the, the uh, talk. Um, so here's the outline real quick. So we're gonna go over IoT botnet history. Um, we're gonna go over the actual botnet scene a little bit, um, talk about the architecture of botnets and how they spread and propagate. Um, and then we're gonna talk about the firmware vulnerabilities that enable them and steps to move forward for vendors. Um, so starting off, just with IoT botnet history. So what is an IoT botnet? So if you're here watching um, for IoT Village, you probably are aware of IoT issues and botnets in general. But for those who haven't seen um, anything about them, 
Um, they're basically a network of hacked IoT devices that are basically internet-connected devices like routers, set-top boxes, webcams, your toaster, as uh, this little toaster on here has a little script on how to scrape Shodan for uh, Linksys routers. Um, but So they're used primarily for DDoS, and they're sometimes used for crypto mining and um, also tunneling and proxying traffic. Um, and so for this thing, I'm gonna, this, this talk is kind of more of a cultural as it is technical, and I kind of want to be able to um, kind of go through a lot of the confusing nomenclature um, that surrounds this because there's, there's a ton of it. Um, people call botnets by a million different names, um, whether you're talking to a researcher or talking to a person who develops them, um, there are a ton of different types. So it's going to go through a little bit of the history here. So um, IoT botnets, as they're known right now, can be traced back to, I guess, 2014 ish when lizard squad came out with the the i guess the botnet the malware with the most names of it, like any malware um it's been termed bash light it can also be called lulz bot torless liz kebab lizard stressor ball pit uh gaffigit and just a bajillion other names um and so it was spread by exploiting shell shock vulnerabilities and shell shock came out uh, and busy box on a bunch of different devices so there was People were, were you know, scanning the entire internet for, for shell shock vulnerabilities because they were all over the place, but they were very, very common in a lot of IoT devices. Um, and so when this was actually happening, though, there were actually a lot of different botnets or bots that were being distributed because there hadn't been as many sources as there are now. Um, so you, you've heard of Kai-10, which is like an IRC C2 based uh, botnet that was spread a lot, as well as like just Perl bots that are just literally DDoS bots that are that are written in Perl. Um, so the source code for this was leaked in 2015, and a lot of people started to work on it. And so collectively, it's hard to choose one name for them, but collectively, I would say that these would be categorized as QBot. Um, which is unrelated again to the uh, CACBot malware, which people call QBot. Um, and so, yeah, new devices of, that are still vulnerable to this exact same vulnerability appear online, like newly <laughs> to this day. Um, and so fast forward a couple of years. So um, Mira came out in 2016. And so it was used in some famous DDoS attacks like the Dyne DDoS attacks, uh, the ones on Brian Krebs and some other people. Um, but it was leaked um, shortly after some of the bigger DDoS attacks happened. And people started to immediately use it because it was a lot more streamlined than the previous versions of DDoS um, malware. A lot of the stuff was in, you know, really uh, simple one one file uh, bots and servers. Um, very very basic stuff over Telnet. Um, so Mirai was a lot more streamlined. Um, it was very modular. So there's different files that made it easier for you to plug in new exploits into, and um, also made it easier for you to have like access control for for users that were coming on. And so um, it also had a bit better code. It was um, definitely still not the best, but it's a lot better than the previous uh, code for Liz Kebab and or Lulzbot. Um, it also had a SQL server on there, which made it running the server a lot easier for them. Um, and so it seems like everybody has a botnet uh, fork these days <laughs> since, since then. Um, so there's other IoT botnets that are pretty major that have come out. Um, a big one that you may have heard of was Satori or FBot or Okiru, and it's a pretty well-known Mirai fork that's a bit different from some of the other ones because a lot of them are kind of just very copy-pasted, stack overflow questions fit into some Golang and C code. Um, but so this one here had a bit, so the person who was doing it had definitely knew what they were doing a bit more than most people. Um, and that person actually just went to jail recently. Um, we've also seen Brickerbot, which is the, uh, the the botnet that would uh, just basically infect and break IoT devices. And there's been a few iterations of it. Um, there was a, one in 2017, and then there was one recently, I think it was like a 13-year-old kid or something like that that did it as well. Um, a newer one, really interesting, is Kaiji, which is Golang-based, um, cross-compiled SSH brute forcer. And it actually installs a rootkit or tries to to uh, establish persistence, um, which is really interesting. I'll get into that more later. Uh, Access R is another one that I've seen. I just threw in there because I didn't hear anybody talking about that one, but it's uh, more modular, still crappy. Um, and then we have various uh, Bitcoin miner botnets that you may have seen. It's harder to do Bitcoin mining on an IoT device because they don't have as much CPU power and no GPU, um, but they're still out there. And then I also did a, a write-up on some um, Mirai variants that are targeting FPGAs and like some really exotic architectures, um, which uh, I have a link in the citations at the end here. Um, or you can go on my website and see it. Um, so yeah, botnet activity growth 
I mean, like similarly to Qbot, Mirai just started popping up all over the place once it was leaked. And they, they became basically a huge marketplace for people who are trying to sell spots on the botnet, right? Like there's reseller markets, affiliate programs and incentives for having it grow. Um, and also booting itself, uh, you know, DDoSing somebody, um, their home router um, became a really common thing for people to actually, um, you know, try and do because it's just like a, a way to knock people offline, especially if they're you're mad at them in Call of Duty or something. And so, um, yeah, it's basically just like the thing that people start to do. And so like, you know, though, um, as these things develop and grow, like a thousand monkeys at a thousand terminals will eventually take out the uh, the internet. And that's kind of what's been happening. Um, and so we'll get a little bit into the scene here. So the botnet scene at a glance, um, there's entire communities that are dedicated specifically to just bot one botnet or one botnet group. And they are uh, usually talking on Discord. Sometimes they're on forums or IRC. Um, there used to be definitely more IRC back in the day where people would have C2s connected to IRC. Um, but nowadays, it's more Discord that are, people are talking. Um, advertising is done on literally every single social media platform you can think of. I think um, somebody found Pinterest that had somebody advertising uh, botnets. But yeah, if you go on Instagram and just literally search botnet or Qbot or botnet setup, or YouTube, you will find somebody advertising their latest uh, slamming botnet. Um, and so booter time is uh, generally sold um, people for DDoS um, through a, or through a web panel um, or through a, a telnet interface. But that's like the main thing that people are trying to do is just sell time on the botnet. Um, and so you will see here on the bottom, it might be a little small for some of you, but there's um, just some advertisements for uh, different botnets. Um, and also some videos on, you know, how to boot people offline and how to do it using just an Android and, you know, best booters 2020. It's, you know, these all have hundreds of thousands of views too. So these are people that are um, really, uh, they're really going hard with the advertising. Um, so the sources, so I talked about the sources that have kind of been modified to people. Um, they're usually distributed as zips or, or RARs or whatever. Um, and they are sold for about $500 to $300 uh, USD from just what I've seen. Um, so the authors will typically change very little of the code base. Uh, usually just involves something as simple as just changing the ASCII art um, or changing the variable names, something like a control, control F and replace. Um, and sometimes they might even add a new exploit, um, which is always interesting. But exploits themselves um, to load bots are sometimes sold, um, but a lot of them are literally like you can you can Google any part of the script and you will find the exploit DB. Um, uh, link of where they took it from. Uh, the ones that are sold though from ExploitDB or Metasploit modules are usually backdoored. Uh, and it's really funny. They just have like a base 64 blob that just like runs like import OS and then just run this uh, or import sys and, and run this or whatever. Um, and so when I was going through and, and finding a lot of these sources though, I would find that when people would scam each other or rip off somebody or like, you know, somebody had a fight with them, they would leak each other's source code, which is great for threat intel people and reverse engineers who want to figure out what's going on um, because they would just be like, oh, hey, here's this person. Here's uh, everything they've done. Here's their botnet and here's their code. And you can just kind of scoop it up and take a look at it. Um, and so selling spots, um, primary source of revenue, as I said, um, they're typically sold in weekly, monthly, or lifetime plans. You can see a breakdown of plans over here. Um, pretty cheap, too. Um, the lifetime is always really funny to me because it really just means for the duration of the bot's lifetime, botnet's lifetime. Um, and sometimes that does not last longer than the three three days or a month, uh, depending on how uh, how bad their operation is. Um, some more, more enterprising people, people who are a bit more advanced might use a web stressor and they can sell access to that um, you know, with users and everything um, for a web browser. There's been a few big web stressors that have been taken down and some that are still up. Um, web stressor source leaked, volumes in the web stressor. There's so much surrounding that that adds a bit of abstraction to it that makes it harder to manage. Um, and then, yeah, finally, some people act as resellers and they get a cut of the sales um, over, over time. Um, so who runs a botnet, right? IoT botnet operators, um, you know, based on what I've seen in the scene, I guess. It, they're usually pretty young, um, you know, high school age, sometimes college age. Uh, they're somewhat experienced with computers, but they're usually not like developers. Um, 
they learn a lot through YouTube and through like text files, which um, I have a collection of them in um, the, the GitHub that I'll explain in a little bit, um, which are just tutorials on how to set them up. Uh, basically, like how to spin up a rel box um, and uh, how to like, you know, actually, hold on one second. How to actually, uh, it's called like just do the basic things that compile with GCC. Um, a lot of the times though, they really oh, have no clue what they're doing. Um, so you'll see people who are, you know, trying to get support for different botnets and they're, you know, really confused about GCC or, you know, what access control is. Um, but more sophisticated people um, might have a web stressor or an API, like I said before. Um, people will use cryptocurrency instead of PayPal, which is very common for some reason, even though it's like tied to your bank directly. Um, in some cases, though, people will also use botnets for additional purposes like uh, proxying traffic. So sometimes you'll see fly by night sort of VPN operations that might be doing something shady like, uh, you know, routing their traffic through routers, and that's just their VPN somehow. Um, but yeah. Um, so why run an IoT botnet? So I mean, just as much most malware is, um, there's a lot of the similar reasons, but there's a lot of stuff that comes with the fact that there's a lot of younger kids involved in this. Um, so they usually do it for either money, um, you know, because people can earn money from the sell, the sale of uh, botnet spots. A lot of people do this for attention. Um, people, you know, seek attention for stuff, even if it's not even a DDoS, and it's just like a regular production outage. Some people might say, oh yeah. Um, I, uh, I, my, my group, uh, we, we DDoS these people and, you know, we're going to, we're going to extort them for money. And then you look at their status page, it's like, oh yeah, sorry, we had a blip in, you know, updating this thing and we're, we're back now. Um, <laughs> which is always awesome. Uh, supply and demand, um, it's definitely people who want, you know, to DDoS, uh, each other. Um, and so that's, you know, definitely wanting to meet that demand is something that, you know, it's, it's good for any young entrepreneur. Um, revenge is also big. I see a lot of people claiming that somebody, you know, docks them or DDoS them and they want to get back at them by getting their IP and booting them offline. And then people are also inspired a lot by past attacks um, because people have seen what actually happens if somebody DDoSes and takes out, you know, the internet. Um, they want to be, you know, doing that. And also it's incredibly easy uh, to set up an IoT botnet. Um, so let's take a little bit of time to go over the architecture of DDoS botnets. So um, as I said before, earlier botnets used standalone bot files and C2 files that were just compiled with GCC or UC libc um, for cross-compiling. Um, they were very, very simple um, to set up and, and deploy. Um, some of them for C2 itself, they used like IRC for command and control, and they'd have IRC, like very bare bones IRC clients um, connected to their, uh, or like within their, their bots. Um, but Mirai modernized it, and they have actually a CT protocol um, that is used, and they have like a SQL backend for tracking bots and all that. Um, and so web stressors will will use uh, PHP um, and some other, uh, I guess, API stuff for for managing the bots. But it's it's definitely evolved a lot more than it used to be like five years ago, um, which is interesting to see. Um, so the life cycle of a botnet is uh, usually very, very short. Um, you don't see them for very long, um, not going to be over a month or two. Um, basically, somebody will set up a C2 on like a lax VPS host. They'll scan for the vulnerable devices. They'll get some bots to their, their botnet. They'll advertise their spots and then use it. Um, and then the takedown goes one of two ways. Either somebody like, say, Bad Package Report will tweet out the uh, – their their botnet to the the and tag the web stressor I mean the uh, sorry the web host sorry um, and you know somebody will notice it and get it taken down or somebody else's botnet will start kicking their bots from the system and they won't be able to keep up and they'll lose power um, but then it'll just keep happening again this is just the same thing we see over and over again um, hold on one moment. Okay, cool. I had to take a sip of water. Um, so this inevitably leads to a king of the hill game for botnets. Um, they're very territorial. People are, you know, targeting one specific type of device with one specific vulnerability, but they've coded into their variant. And then when somebody else gets the same idea, um, you know, they'll start tacking and, and doing things like that, um, getting their, their bots on there. Um, anybody who touches the device is usually already has root access, but they might have either like some weird 
file system or there's no way to really reconfigure it or they might not know how to reconfigure the device to kick everybody else out. But basically every bot will only last as long as it can before somebody else takes its place. And also there's really no repercussions for this. So everyone's just kind of slamming on different uh, IoT devices um, and pictured as the IoT operator or botnet operator watching their bot count drop. Um, so evasion is um, definitely an interesting aspect of this. So there's there's a lot of very simplistic invasion, uh, evasion that you'll see here. Um, this one up uh, at the top here is somebody just uh, re renaming their process to drop bear, um, which is, I guess, it, it works, but it's also used by everybody. So then everybody will just kill the drop, the drop bear process once they log on. Um, but that's realistically, this is not to hide from, you know, any sort of firewall or any sort of AV or anything. It's only really used to evade other botnet operators. And so they'll do things like, you know, the process masking. They might learn about a different area of the file system that they can put a bot in. They might hide a backup bot and have, like, potentially something like a cron job. It's, it's always very, very primitive and, like, very, very, like, bespoke. Um, and I actually had a whole code review section that, could have actually been an entire talk, but I had to cut it um, for time here. But there's a lot of very, uh, very strange ways that people try to do evasion, which I would love to talk about at another date. Um, and so bot killing, as I said before, um, people will do this. You'll take a look at this, uh, if you can see it on the side here. Here's a you know an array that's just full of a ton of different bot names. And every time they update this botnet, which I have multiple versions of it, um, they would add more and more of these, but you'll see they'll do things like iterate from one to however many, try to kill every process that's called that, um, or every single version of this specific jack by nips or whatever, two-face. So people will like be aware of different botnets that are operating and what they name them and then put them into their scripts. And it's like a cat and mouse game because nobody can fit everything in there. Otherwise their binary is just gonna be full of strings that ultimately are gonna get detected. Um, by people who are reverse engineering uh, the malware. Um, and so, <laughs> so some, not some, not most, nearly all bots and C2s, I would say all, have really, really silly vulnerabilities that make them incredibly easy to knock offline. And I don't really see too many of these techniques really utilized or advertised by people, but um, in my next slide, I'll show you something interesting, I guess. So here's my non-live demo. Uh, for a C2 killer. So this is something that I found. I definitely was not the first person to find this, but it was part of my testing when I was testing out these different things when I was researching. Um, it's incredibly easy to kill, um, you know, Mirai C2s. Uh, this is a, you know, take your screenshots or whatever. I already put this out on Twitter at some point. Um, but yeah, this is, if you send this to either the admin port or to the heartbeat protocol port, it just, it just seg faults the, uh, the Mirai uh, C2, and I've never seen anybody fix this. This isn't every version of Mirai that I've seen. Um, some people have, had claimed that it was fixed, but I, I still, after reviewing every single one of them that I could find, I've never seen that. And so take a bit of se a second, um, the last little bit on the botnet scene here. Um, you know, when I was going through and, and doing this work, I ended up creating a tool um, to help me track all this stuff. And I, I put it out on GitHub. It hasn't been updated for a bit because it just I've gotten too many other projects to do, but it's um it's a a, a static analysis and classification tool for for uh, zip files and and binaries and things like that. It just feeds it all into a big elastic search database. Um, I definitely I'm taking the next week off of work, so I'm gonna I'm gonna take some time to uh, push my big update to this. But if you want to check it out, definitely do it. I have some new things like an API, um, different symbol hashes and key extraction techniques in there. Um, but it was just mainly for me for fast analysis because I was, you know, I had uh, was basically feeding in either new new source code or new um, bot uh, binaries into this and, and just tracking them. But it works for other malware too. Um, also, if you want to, um, I had a Twitter that was deleted by Twitter for some reason that um, was called Threatland, but that was the name of the project that I used to track all these sources. So I have like every Mirai and Qbot and other botnet, just even beyond IoT, um, I tracked them all in a big repo 
uh, called TL Bots, and I have a few other repos if you want to check them out for like fraud tools and stuff. But um, yeah, there's literally clone that. There's like a gigabyte worth of zip files of every malware source code that I could find. Um, yeah, so now we're gonna get into talking about vulnerabilities, and this is kind of this this aspect of it is a bit more about like stuff for devs um, because I wanted to be able to to give info for developers who are working on IoT devices to take all of what I just said there and put it into context for their actual security architecture. Um, so let me take another sip of water. Um, so, okay, so we're here, we're peering into the void here. So <laughs> here is, uh, if you ever have gone on gray noise, they have a lot of tags for uh, different either vulnerabilities themselves um, of the people are scanning for, or just classes of, of you know, malicious traffic. Um, if you do a search just for Mirai, uh, you'll see here it's very, very tiny, but there's, there's four and a half million results for in unique devices that have been scanning with Mirai-like traffic. So that gives you a, a rough example of, of how many people are, or how many devices are actually infected and actively scanning. Um, and then the other one is just a Shodan search for this hacked router help SOS had dupe password um, thing, which there are still, this is, I think that that hack happened like four years ago and there's still 6,500 devices that have been hacked uh, and have this host name. So it's uh, always heartwarming to see, I guess. Um, so what types of vulns are exploited by these botnets? So it's always very basic stuff here. We're talking about weak auth and, and auth bypass. So if there's either admin admin as the credentials or there's like a, a page that you can you know run OS commands on that doesn't actually need a password to be you know uh, interacted with. Um, there's also command injection like like shell shock and and just other really silly uh, command injection stuff. Um, there's also a lot of common exploits in specific services and libraries like the Realtek UPnP SDK, which had a, a vuln that was like in everything. It was in so many different uh, devices. Um, Go ahead webs and think PHP also have um, vulns that were in a lot of places, like thousands and thousands of stuff were affected by Go Ahead. Um, and so more rare though, you'll see actual shell code and, and binary exploits, um, which is always interesting to see because you know, you'll know you have devices that you know are using like the same base address and they can just do a shell code exploit um, very, very easily. Um, but it, it, they're not as common as, um, as you'd think. And I think it might be because People don't know how to code a shell code um, or how to inject shell code like with a in C, like when they're writing their bots. So who knows? But you'll see them in bot loaders for sure. Um, and a lot of other vectors include previously compromised devices. So like if you people sell lists of compromised devices um, for a specific category of devices, um, which there might eh, I don't actually know if there's any in my repo, but um, I have <laughs> seen a bunch of them where people are basically just passing those things around. Um, so we're looking at the most targeted devices here. So if you want to see, you know, what vulns are most leveraged by these, these botnets, um, I have a command ta or a table here of basically I went through every every source code that we that we could find. There's like a several hundred uh, unique source codes, and these are the the main ones that people are using. Um, a lot of them here don't actually have any like CVE or CPE or any vendor acknowledgement. So you can only really find them by kind of looking up what the traffic is or what the command injection attempt was on, you know, in your log files. Um, actually, more than half of these don't have any CV at all. Um, like the AV Tech one, which I think is being used in um, in the IoT CTF right now, doesn't doesn't have a, C, uh, a CVE or anything. And it's just a blog post that, you know, people have written about it. Um, same with like, uh, you know, some of these Netgear ones, the Netgear DGN 1000, that's a huge one that people have exploited. I've never seen a CVE for. Um, you know, the HNAP, Vacron, like Zixel stuff, uh, even uh, actually Go Ahead Webs has them. Um, but here, these aren't even SSH or Telnet brute force stuff. This is like, like a lot of the stuff here is like buffer overflow or like command injection. Some of these aren't even being tracked by anybody. Um, so when a new exploit comes out though, bot scanners will really just immediately start trying to load bots with like whatever POC people have. Um, and it's usually IoT bots and it's very uh, annoying. Um, so the infection spillover from that, so like these malware families are, you know, running on a super diverse array of architectures. Like there's every architecture you can think of is, 
has a Mirai variant for it at this point because um, of cross-compiling. But this means that this can affect other hosts that aren't IoT. And so people will try to use and they'll try to get Mirai onto things like web servers using like Drupal get in or Apache struts or, you know, uh, couch DB or whatever thing is running, um, they're going to try to do that to have that be the scanner as well. Um, and so these sort of infection spillover is, is really common. And you'll see sometimes like IoT botnets are using Drupal again. And you're like, what router is running Drupal? It's because they're trying to get onto everything. Um, and so um, why are these devices so easy to exploit? Um, and so we've talked, we we're talking about this in the last um, talk here about, uh, you know, supply chain issues. And so there's, it's very difficult to validate the supply chain is a big one. There's vulnerable software and libraries that people use. Um, that they might not be able to change or have the, the people to even, you know, make the changes for it. Um, easy to guess default passwords is a huge one. Um, devices by default doing port forwarding and listening on the internet. Giant list of vulnerable devices are passed around, which makes it even easier for people who don't know what they're doing to just start exploiting. Um, and then it all comes down to insufficient or non-existent security practices in development. And so uh, we're going to get a little bit into firmware bones now and, and security practices. So um, you'll see there was a awesome talk, I think, two years ago, ShmooCon, um, about um, firmware bones by CITL. Um, and so there's a lot of stuff like vendor security practices on a binary level are like they're you know, almost non-existent. And there's even regression analysis to show that firmware is actually becoming worse and having more vulnerabilities introduced to them in a 15-year data set, which is insane to me. Um, so you see here, here's like every vendor that they had um, looked at. And you see anything that's closer to the edge here is going to have more of these uh, things like stack guards or non-executable stack or railroad, ASLR. Things that are closer to the edge are scoring higher and actually that means that more binaries have these mitigations in place but if you can see there's very very few that actually have anything on the graph um and then the ones that do they only have like one or two and there's very few um it's it's kind of sad you, you want this whole all these things to be blue uh, all the way blue and there, there's like lines of blue um which is really uh, disheartening here um and so uh why is firmware so difficult to maintain? So there's so many reasons for it. And I, I used to have done firmware development before um, for embedded devices. And you know, even what I the, the experience that I had doing that is still, you know, I, I could see all the echoes of this throughout the process, right? Because re-architecting cost is is a huge thing. Cost is usually the biggest factor for you know why things aren't changing. Um, but you can also be locked into a vendor contract. You can be locked into like a middleware contract, so you can only use drivers for this one, you know, piece of your of your kit, um, and you have to use it for a certain period of time. Um, you might have unsupported chips or hardware to work with. Um, another huge thing is outdated tool chains. You might be using some tool chain from like 2005, and that's how you build everything in 2020. Um, there's also a lot of things like hardware restraints, which you know, sometimes you might not, like your hardware itself might not support like the SSL version that you need to. That was an issue that I've had to deal with before, trying to figure out how you can, you know, jerry-rig a new um, SSL encryption scheme and support uh, newer versions of TLS um, in, in firmware that's, you know, 15 years old. Um, sometimes you also need to maintain backwards compatibility, which is a big thing um, to make this stuff really, it makes it very, very hard. And you have to include stuff that you might not want to. Um, a lot of stuff, though, is is a, a lack of dependable updates for for users to update their devices. Um, so even if you have you know all the other things in place here, um, it's sometimes people don't have like a way to actually update the devices without some complicated process. Um, poor communication channels to even tell people about vulnerabilities is also a big thing. And vendors might not have any sort of like channels for reporting bugs or telling people about bugs um, as well. And then you know, lack of modern security measures um, like secure boot or you know, binary hardening we talked about before or code signing are, are not going to really be in place. And it's hard to get those things back into your you know pipeline if you have to do a bunch of testing and you only have a couple people working on the thing. Um, and so why do we see a lot of this older stuff working? So there's some sometimes you'll actually see QBots or Kaiten bots or even Pro bots. Um, trying to exploit stuff in your logs. And you know, if you download the binary, 
Um, and it's because the vulnerabilities are still there, right? And so this is something that I had um, actually to steal an analogy, analogy from Mudge, right? In mining, there's indicator minerals that can prove that there are other um, things that you, um, what's it called? There's like a, like say you're looking for like diamonds or something. Um, there's a, like indicator materials that prove that this might be there. The, the, the thing that you're looking for might be there. And so the, um, what's it called? The security vulnerabilities that we're seeing are showing that there are not as many um, security practices that are being followed, which means that the older vulnerabilities are still going to be able to work, right? So like we're seeing like, you know, there's still command injection here in 2020 and that you can still run a QBot or a Perl bot on this device, this means that there's really not anything that's going into the actual process of making the binary or the devices any uh, any more secure. Um, and what's interesting is this is rare in other classes of malware, like say for for desktop computers, um, because there's no patch really that you can apply to one specific device or whatever. Um, so each time that there's a new vuln that comes out there's all these new devices that are added to the pool, but there's still all the routers from 2014 that had shell shock vulnerabilities in them and DVRs that still have auth bypass in them. And those are all just getting added to the pool. So people are just trying the same old techniques and they're still getting the actual devices that they would have exploited you know, before. Um, so it's, it's kind of, uh, kind of frustrating. Um, so moving forward, this is the big thing for vendors and people who are you know, developers um, of firmware and embedded devices. So what can we actually do to solve any of these problems here? So we can only really fix them by having better developer development practices for security by meeting the developers and the vendors where they're at. Because they're, we want them to be, you know, on top of their game and actually doing, you know, the the work that we'd like them to put in, so that our, you know, toaster isn't, you know, DDoSing somebody because <laughs> because of some Mirai variant from that's run by like a 14 year old kid. Um, so we have to like actually talk to them, talk to the vendors the way that they, the things that they already know um, in, in their, the, the way that they're already developing things. And so for vendors, I guess my big advice here is to invest in developer training and to establish best practices and create security testing pipelines um, and encourage researchers to actually find vulns and disclose them properly. Um, we can mitigate some of the existing vulns by encouraging safer use of IoT devices, but it only works so much because Imagine trying to explain to your parents uh, how to, you know, turn off port forwarding uh, on their um, on their router, right? Like they're not really going to understand it in the way that you might. I mean, they might, but they, um, you know, it's sometimes hard to get end users to actually follow your guidelines at all. They might not even be able to to be aware of it. Um, but that's one specific way that we can mitigate that. Um, establishing best practices, though, is a, a thing I wanted to highlight for a second here. Um, so like auditing uh, your development cycle itself, um, it definitely depends on what you're building and you have to tailor it to that and be able to audit and say, hey, yeah, we are using C, we are using, you know, this tool chain, we're using either GCC or, you know, uh, um, <laughs> UC libc or, or whatever um, to, uh, you know, develop our firmware. Um, but there are, there are best practices for these things. So OWASP, um, something that I had when I was doing firmware stuff, I had made um, developers, I had them look at these some of these cheat sheets for for OWASP on like tool chain hardening, on like input sanitization for for web apps and and you know how to do other things to the, you know the best the best practices that there are. And there's tons of different ones like this. I just post to OWASP, OWASP because it's um it's you know very accessible for a lot of people and it's free. Um, another big thing is CIS benchmarks. Um, you know, there's depending on what you're building, there are benchmarks for security that you can follow, um, which are super duper useful. Um, you know, you can even automate that. I had done like Ansible CIS benchmarks before. Um, you can build those into tool chains pretty easily. Um, and then also, if you really need to, hire a consultant to come in and, and do all this work with you and, and work through it with your team. But that's definitely a huge thing for uh, for vendors. Um, vuln disclosure, though, is probably my favorite one to talk about and the biggest one. So when you do find people that are actually poking at your stuff, allow them to disclose vulnerabilities. Like, please, if you are a vendor and you're listening, there are ways now. It's 2020. You can have a VDP. You can, ha can have a bug bounty. 
you have to go through the channel, the proper channels and make sure it's right for you. But there are a ton of resources. Disclose.io has like really good legal language and other things, resources for vendors. Um, but yeah, people who do IoT research sometimes either get no response or they get, you know, a summons to you know, get sued for something. Um, establish security contact though um, and listen to emails. There's security.txt is a really easy way on your vendor website to just have a email that somebody who has an issue or a vulnerability can talk to and not feel like they're you know trying to chase you down. Because like how many times do you see people on Twitter going, hey, does anybody have a vendor contact for like this company? And like nobody responds. It's like if we have to go on Twitter to to ask about this, not only does it draw more attention to your, you know, the vulnerability, but it also makes you look bad. So definitely um, you know, keep up with that stuff. Um, work with researchers too, because people who are bringing stuff up to you, they wanna help you. If somebody wants to just use your device or crypto mining or you know, to DDoS you know, some kid on Minecraft, they're not gonna tell you about it. So if you have a researcher that's here and talking to you, they wanna help you and you should definitely you know, heed their advice. Um, and have some open channel with your customers too to have the word out about vulnerabilities. Like if you either you do an internal thing or you submit to CVEs and then you post them on Twitter, whatever you do, just have something so people can know to update their devices. Um, and ultimately all these are elements of a vulnerability disclosure program. So if you put this all together, you have you know the, the baseline for what you need to actually have one, um, which is awesome. And so I done a uh, a little quick uh, question out there on Twitter, which you can see, um, I have the link here. Um, but these are some community suggestions for what vendors can do. Um, you know, everything from automatic updates to, I like the uh, make a security a named person's problem. Um, so like having say like, I don't know, like Sherry has to, to deal with the, you know, firmware bones that come in. So, you know, talk to her if there's an issue. Um, you know, other things like minimizing attack surfaces, code signing, like a lot of this stuff is gonna be part of other, um, you know, best practices that you're gonna have to implement, but these are all, um, you know, elements of things that might be good for you to consider moving forward. Um, default settings definitely <laughs> should be sane and with security in mind, and also don't reinvent the wheel. So final thoughts here, I got two minutes left just about. So we wanna make it less easy for people to run botnets, right, overall. Um, the supply is already there. The demand is great. Everything is set up. People can off the shelf, you know, get several thousand bots on botnet in an afternoon. Um, botnet authors are definitely getting a lot smarter. Um, people are using the messy landscape of this to take control of it. Like if you see with the Kaiji botnet, which is definitely a lot more advanced than previous stuff. Um, people are, are going to be using this for more nefarious purposes. And because there's so much um, going on in this space, um, it's very hard to pick out who is either a nation state trying to get, you know, access into your router or it's just some random kid who has no idea what they're doing. Um, and new devices and architectures are always being targeted. As I said, FPGAs, there's tons of new stuff. Um, you can read that analysis that I wrote. Um, you know, if you don't act soon, like the new products that you put out are already going to be dead on arrival um, and exploitable once they come out. Um, and so, yeah. Um, the Q&A for this is going to be done in the DEF CON Discord, as you might have seen in the, the Twitch chat. So if you have questions, or you can always hit me up on Twitter, uh, at NetSpooky. Um, you know, my DMs are open there. Um, I got some shout outs real quick. Uh, shout out to the Safari Zone crew, which is the people that have always been there to look for weird stuff on the internet. Hopefully we'll have a zine coming out soon. Um, Threatland, everybody who helped out with that project to collect sources. And of course, the entire community of Thug Crowd. Uh, special shout out to Hermit for helping me go through so much of this and be such an awesome person for um, you know looking at logs and other weird stuff. Oops, um, hold on. Um, <laughs> like being able to tell me about a lot of interesting things that she has found. Um, Andrew Morris, um, at Gray Noise, thanks so much for letting me um, use your data set too before it's even publicly available. Um, thanks to Mudge for coming in uh, hot with some hot takes for me um, when I was building this talk. Um, check out Ilya's IoT Village talk on emulating IoT devices and malware because we actually did a lot of that when I was writing this talk. And then thanks also to Dade for that theme song. Um, so I'll have slides out. I'll tweet them out. Just follow me on Twitter and you'll see. Um, I have citations here if you want to read them. But yeah, thanks everybody. <laughs>